It's a time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, one day. Every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to work. the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come, come. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, Lakewood Church family, to those who are here with us today. I want to say happy Sabbath to those of us joining on Zoom. It is a, a joy and a pleasure to worship with you here this morning. This week, I, so I subscribe to a, an email that I receive every day from CNN, and they, they send out five things that you need to know for the day. And there's always like a bit of good news at the bottom, thankfully. So this week, there was a, um, a European wildlife photography contest. And they announced the winners. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it was on, it was, I saw it on CNN. And the winner of this photo was, is a biologist who took this photo in Brazil. And it is a really magnified photo image of a stink bug, like a mom stink bug protecting and shielding her eggs and some newly hatched larvae. And this stink bug, the, the biologist said, is 14 millimeters. That's a little, call it half an inch, okay? So there's this tiny stink bug and he's zoomed in on this photo and you can see that under the stink bug there's eggs, there's larvae. And the way that the photographer described the image, he said, this it, um, captures motherly love. And it got me thinking this week, if a mother stink bug cares like that, you know, so much for her eggs, for her newly hatched little baby stink bugs, how much more? Does our Heavenly Father care for us? And how much more is he willing to shield us, to cover us with his love, with his grace, with his mercy? I, I would love, love to show you this photo, but if you just um, Google it, you can, you can see it. So as we reflect on God's love and care and tenderness for us, you know, it is... Truly, let it be our desire to honor him and to give him all of us. So we will sing for our first song, I Give You My Heart.
We will invite Laura up to have our prayer, and you may have heard that today is a special day where we are having 12 hours of prayer, which Laura will speak more about. Happy Sabbath, church. And how is everybody? I hope well. Now you were all blessed. Um, as Andrea said, today is our prayer day. We're praying for seven, I mean for 12 hours, from seven in the morning till seven at night. Some of us already started praying. We had a nice breakfast. We prayed at the top of the hour at seven, at eight, at nine, at 10, and 11. It's 11.32. But I am doing a prayer now for those things that we're going to be praying for. If you signed up and you cannot remember what time to you sign, we did put a sign on the front door, but uh, you are welcome to come any at top of the hour you wanna come. We have uh, the pastor's office here that you can quietly come and if you're a group, you decide everybody can pray together or one person at a time can pray. The important thing is, is to pray for the things that uh, the conference has asked us to pray for, which are very important. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives in our order to have church unity. If we do not have the Spirit of God within us individually and as a church as a whole, we are not going to be a united church. And I'm not just talking about Lakewood Church and Walk of Faith Church. or I'm talking about the world church. We have to be united, and the only way that will happen is if the Holy Spirit comes to us. So we need to ask for that. The other thing is we need to pray for the youth and the teenagers of our churches. We're all not gonna live here eternally unless we are here when Jesus comes, okay? I give myself maybe a good 20, 25 years and I'm gone, so I'm not gonna be here. But hopefully somebody like Penelope or you know any of the other young people here, Salatio Jr., Okay, they will be here. Okay, we're not, I'm not going to be here forever. So we need to pray for our youth that God, the Spirit of God, motivates them to want to be leaders on this church. And then the other thing we need is to pray for Camp Mohaven. Why? Because Camp Mohaven is one of the instruments that God is using to prepare the young people and the children that we have in the church. And also, no school, but we're praying for Camp Mohaven because Camp Mohaven right now needs funds. We need to expand. We need to make, you know, the environment there more conducive to attracting young people and uh, teenagers. And I will tell you, my two grandsons are there. The seed has been planted. So I know that they know about the Lord, and I know that when it gets to the right time, the Lord will bring them back here. So, so let's bow our heads and pray for these things. Uh, please do come if you sign in. Come to this little room here, or if you prefer going downstairs so you don't hear loud music, that's fine too. But uh, let's pray top of the hour. At the end, during the potluck, we're going to pray, and at the end of the uh, potluck period, if, if you want to stay, let me know. We can keep the church open. We can all come and pray every hour on the top of the hour till 7 o'clock at night. And if not, uh, you can pray at home. But let me know if you want to stay so I stay here and I keep the, the church open. Okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father that are in heaven, I glorify you, dear Lord, for the Sabbath. I glorify you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the gift of the Spirit and all the blessings you give us every day. And Lord, we need that gift of the Holy Spirit. Our church needs the Holy Spirit. We need to be a united church because 
A big wave of hardship is coming, Lord, and if we're not ready to receive you because we haven't been strong as a church, we're not going to be, um, we might fail. So, Lord, we ask that you strengthen us with your spirit, guide us, give us the wisdom of the spirit, and make us one like you, the Father, and Jesus Christ and the Spirit are one. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you also prepare the youth of our church, our children, our teenagers, our young adults, Lord. They need to be the leaders of our church. And in order to do that, they need to see that we are a united front as a church. And they need to be prepared in their faith. Their faith has to be strengthened. It cannot be just coming to church on Saturday to sing. It has to be to have the heart of Jesus, the mind of Jesus, for them to be good leaders. So we pray for them. And also, Heavenly Father, I pray for all those who right now are leaders in children's ministry so they can be an example to, to their children and uh, to the young people that come here. And finally, Heavenly Father, I pray that you touch the hearts of each one of us to give sacrificially to help Camp Mohaven, dear Lord, because that is an open door to bring not only the children of our church, but also children that are not part of the church yet. Bless the pastor who's going to be preaching tonight. Bless everyone here. And Lord, guide us with your spirit. I ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Laura. That is a really important initiative that we have going on today. And we do want to welcome, actually, our speaker and his family who are here with us today, Pastor Joe Ottinger, his wife Paula, and their daughter Bella. So welcome. We're so happy you are here with us. And let's continue our service by singing our hymn, Give Me Jesus, hymn 305. <laughs>
just give me Jesus. Oh, when I come to die, oh, when I come to Those three simple words, right? <coughs> Give me Jesus. At this time, we'll ask the deacons to come forward and collect today's offering. Our loose offering today that is collected is going towards our local church budget. And we will have a prayer at the end of the offering collection. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with open hearts, Lord. Lord, that are hearts that are receptive to hear your word and your message. Thank you for the opportunity that you give each and every one of us to give back, to return our tithes and offerings to you, Father. And may the funds that we have collected here and every Sabbath go to further the work and Lord and hasten your soon coming so that we can soon be reunited with you. Lord bless all of us here today. It is in Jesus name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand as we sing this song, The Goodness of God.
Amen. Please be seated. Josiah will bring us our scripture reading this morning, found in Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 and 2. Good morning, church. Today, I will be reading Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess this, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I gave you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Thank you, Josiah. At this time, we invite the children to make their way down to the basement for Children's Church. Louise is our teacher today. So all my little friends, if you want to follow Louise, down to the basement for Children's Church. Pastor Joe, the time is yours. Well, good morning, church. And happy Sabbath to each one. It is a privilege to be here again, actually. I was here for the town hall meetings, uh, but a beautiful church. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be back and speak here. So thank you for the invitation. I am still, I think, the new youth director because I have not made it yet a year. So everything is still brand new to me. Uh, this, I think, is one of the first churches that I have been to twice in our conference. So maybe I am finally through things. Actually, I know that's not true because there's many churches that I have not been to, but have the privilege of going to Pinewood Derby and Pathfinder Bible Experience. Uh, in fact, very close by, we had a group of our Pathfinders that took first place uh, down in Florida this year, down over the uh, Westlake Church. Adventure Fun Day, Camp Mohaven, where we have, of course, our staff. I see Layla here and maybe some others. I don't know. Layla, is anyone else in our church here that's staff? No? But Layla's here. We have campers. Uh, probably, hopefully, several of our uh, church here have been campers there. And our friendship camper support that we get from our conference. I just want to thank you for that. And, of course, our Building for Eternity campaign that is happening right now. This week, the focus is on commitment as we begin our prayer time with God and, and uh, looking for that commitment uh, that we are prepared to follow God when God speaks, when he says, this is the time to move and the commitment that he's looking for from you, that we would be willing to, even without seeing the end from the beginning, that we would be willing to, uh, to make that commitment with him. I want to say thank you. I always try to take the opportunity to do this so that if I come back to uh, Lakewood and speak again, you will likely hear me say this again in some way, but thank you to those of you who are committed to Christian education. I say that as one who is a product of Christian education only because of people just like you who gave dollars and five dollars and ten dollars and hundreds of dollars to people that you may not have known. And I realize your gifts didn't put me through school. That was a different time period. But likely they are putting someone just like me through school. And likely it was someone just like you who gave that helped me go to school. Uh, my parents separated when I was young. I was born in South Florida and then grew up most of my life in North Carolina. And now I'm in Ohio, so I'm kind of making my way northward in this adventure, which is uh, perhaps much to my wife's chagrin, who does not like the cold weather. So uh, she moved up here in July, July 1st. I was here January 1st, and she said, so how is it? And I said, oh, it's fantastic. And it has been so far, so nobody mentioned anything about snow or anything else. I'm sure we don't get much in Ohio, but, uh, but anyway, in North Carolina, that's where most of my childhood was. Went to grade school there. My mom, my parents separated when I was younger, like I said, right there in the, uh, the grade school years. And mom did everything she could to keep the four of us, I have three sisters, uh, to keep the four of us in Christian education at our Adventist school and worked every job she could. She worked, uh, she mowed the lawn, we mowed the lawns at the school and the church, and she drove our little church bus for the school, and uh, she was a waitress at a restaurant, and there are all kinds of jobs, but there is no way, and I kind of knew it then, but I definitely know it now, 
there is no way that she made enough money to put all four of us into our Adventist school. And so if not for the commitments of people just like you to help people like myself and my siblings, we would not have had that experience. And so again, from the bottom of my heart, and I say thank you. I know we have Noah here and pray that you guys will be continually committed there and, and seeing our kids there. It is a wonderful opportunity for our kids to be in an environment and I won't even say where they, they, they continue to be on pace with everything else that they're hearing because they're inundated with, with bad information everywhere. It's great for them to be in an environment where they can feel comfortable in sharing the truth. There is a standard of truth. It's not up to you and up to me, but there's a standard of truth that God has given us. And to know that we have a place that we can send our kids and that the community can send their kids where they can hear the truth as God says that it is and then line their lives up with it rather than the flip side of that. Uh, so I'm grateful for those experiences, our, our Adventist education. Uh, in fact, it was at Mount Pisgah Academy, our boarding school down in North Carolina, uh, where I went to school after I left grade school, went up there. Again, I know that, uh, that there is no way we could have afforded that, so if not for people giving money for that, experience, even with all that money that people gave, I still built up a bill as I was going through. Uh, it was kind of a, a discouraging time. It was an exciting time in my boarding school experience because it was there in my, towards the end of my junior year, into my senior year, that I felt like God was calling me to ministry. Finally, an idea of what it is that God wants me to do, right? That, that great call of our hearts. What is my purpose in life? In fact, I was just listening to the news this week. It's one of the, uh, the deficits of our youth and young adults right now. They have no purpose. They have no idea what they should be doing with their life. Again, my, my personal view is we miss our purpose if we have removed ourselves from God in our lives because it is God who tells us, what our ultimate purpose is, right? Uh, so, but it was at Mount Pisgah Academy. I was sitting in our church, kind of right over here in this area, when I just felt impressed that ministry was what God was calling me to. And it's almost like a burden was lifted off my shoulders. You know, everybody else was doing this um, uh, counseling for uh, professional counseling to know what kind of careers I should go into, career counseling. And I just couldn't figure out anything. And finally, that was impressed upon me. And I said, wow, okay. So the answer was for me, ministry. Well, it was in my senior year that we went down to Atlanta with one of our touring groups that I was on. I was on the gymnastics team then, and uh, we went down there, and our bus broke down. So uncommon for an Adventist vehicle to break down. I know that uh, seems like, seems like the, the vehicles we buy and the buildings that we build and maintain, uh, our motto is, don't worry, the Lord's coming back soon. They're like, oh, that's true, but we still need to be here and do ministry while that's the case. But our vehicle broke down, and so we stayed the night in the gym. We got up the next morning, and there was a basketball there. So, of course, guys, we grab the basketball and start playing basketball. And in the midst of this basketball game, Oscar Sherrod, who's our uh, star point guard, is bringing the ball, ball down the court. And I reached his hand as he came by, and the only one more shocked that I had the ball than me was him. Somehow I stole the ball from him. And, and so immediately I start flying down the other way as fast as I could, dribbling and running, dribbling and running, as fast as I could. And he had turned and was running side by side with me. And all of this happens in about two seconds, I'm sure, but it was all this thought process that's going on. I thought to myself, as soon as I go to make a layup, he is gonna block this ball right back down into my face and that will be the story, right? It won't be that I stole the ball from Oscar. It won't be the shot that I, no, it'll just be Oscar blocked the ball, and, and that'll be it. So I'm thinking, what can I do? What can I do as I'm dribbling down the court? And I thought, if I stop, he doesn't know I'm going to stop, and he'll take a couple more steps, and I'll have an easy two-foot jump shot, and my story will be that I stole the ball from Oscar Sherrod. So when I stop, from the other side of the court, they said it sounded like a pencil snapped. And it was my ACL uh, that exploded in my knee. Yes, I appreciate that because it was the, probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced. And I just collapsed to the floor as my right ACL just collapsed or uh, exploded and my right leg hit my left and 
fell down to the floor, his face down, just pounding the court. So painful. And at these moments of intense pain and difficulty in life, that's when you know who your real friends are, right? Because I could hear them. Roll him off the court. <laughs> so they could keep playing. And I would like to say that they didn't, but in fact, they drugged me right off the court, just off the end line, and they kept playing ball. And they're good people. Please don't think badly of them. They really are. But they wanted to finish the game. But my knee was swollen like a cantaloupe immediately. And uh, anyway, I ended up going to the doctor. All of this to say that 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 had revealed to me that ministry would be what God is calling me to immediately was gone. Because I had no money for the surgeries. I had uh, two surgeries for my knee in order to, uh, to get it back to where it needed to be. All the rehab and everything. All of that drained what little bit of money that I had. I'm still in my senior year in academy building up a bill there. In fact, I graduated on crutches. And I knew that I did not have money to pay the bill for Mount Pisgah Academy even. And I would have to show up Monday after graduation and go to work at the nursing home. So Sunday, all of my friends are going out after graduation, uh, going, packing up their cars to leave school, and I knew I wasn't going to be packing up anything. And I knew they'd all be asking questions, why aren't you packing up anything? So in order to avoid it, I told my family, let's just go out to eat, and then we'll come back, say goodbyes and everything else. And uh, so we ended up going out to eat. But I knew that ministry was not what God was calling me to. Because all I could see was the obstacle in front of me. The difficulty that was there. I could not see the other side. And I think about the commitment, right, that we're talking about this week, our, our theme of commitment. My commitment to God was overwhelmed by what I was seeing right in front of me. And we're going to look at a story for a moment. If you have your scriptures with you, open them up to Joshua chapter 3. As you're opening them up, Joshua chapter 3, we got Joshua who's coming in after Moses, right? Moses was the leader of the Israelites as they're wandering through. And right before they enter into the promised land, we have this change of leadership. Not a role that I would want to step into following Moses in the leadership, but Joshua is called to that. In fact, Joshua chapter 1, God spends the whole chapter almost telling Joshua, don't be worried, don't be afraid, right? Be courageous because it's not you, God says. He says, it's me, God says, right? So it's not you, it's me. Don't be terrified, don't be worried and afraid. Be courageous because it's God, not you. So we're going to read through Joshua chapter 3. Some may wonder why. Here is one reason why we're going to read for a moment. A survey from 2021 found that 11% of Americans read the Bible daily. 11%. While 77% of U.S. adults have a Bible, in fact, many of us probably would be able to say we have multiple Bibles, but while 77% of U.S. adults have a Bible, the percentage of adults who are Bible users, and this is the definition for that, People who read the Bible on their own outside of church three to four times a year. So that's the definition. 77% of people have Bibles, but the people who are Bible users, 39%. 39% of our fellow Americans read the Bible three to four times a year. So we'll read the story today. There may be some not as familiar this would be an opportunity for us to hear the story that God has recorded for us to remind us, right? That's what sermons are. That's what the scriptures are, to remind us of who God is with people just like you and me. All right, so Joshua chapter 3, the Bible records for us. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left the Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, where they camped before crossing. We'll pause here. They're about to cross into the Promised Land. For those who aren't as, as familiar with the story, they have been waiting for this promise to be fulfilled to enter into the land that God has promised them. All right, so they're on the cusp of crossing into the Promised Land. Verse 2, three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, 
keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer than that. I have to pause here because there's too many things, probably sermons all in themselves in these couple of verses. But the Ark of the Covenant, and you'll have to forgive me, for the last 10 years I was a chaplain at one of our schools. In fact, it was Mount Pisgah Academy. I had a chance to, uh, to serve where I went to school uh, for the last 10 years. So I ask questions. So it's okay. I won't call specifically on you, but I hope I get a response. The Ark of the Covenant, a significant piece of furniture for the Israelites because why? What is the Ark of the Covenant? Yeah. Okay, that's right. Contains the Ten Commandments. Why else would it be significant? Okay, represents God's throne. In fact, the presence of God, right? God's throne. And it's not an empty throne, but he is present on his throne. And so the scriptures record for us here, the instructions that were given to the people stay back. Well, first of all, they're told, stay close enough because why do you need to stay close? Yeah? Okay, that's true, but specifically, what did we just read? You got to stay close because you don't know the way that you're going, right? I mean, it's true. It's still true today, isn't it? You need to stay close to God's presence because who knows the plans for tomorrow? God alone. We think we can plan things out. We think we have things lined up. There are some here today who thought they'd be eating at noon, even the best plans we have don't work out. God knows, though, right? And that truth is still the same today. And maybe that promises something for someone here. I don't know. But he says to us today the same, stay close to me because you don't know what's ahead. But he does. And it's kind of that comforting thing, right? It's not a, it's not a warning, but it's a comforting thing. Hey, you don't have to worry about tomorrow because God knows and he says, stay close. But then the scriptures record for us this stay back. In fact, the scriptures say a half a mile or so, depending on your version, about a half a mile back from the, uh, from the Ark of the Covenant. And this question I ask of my students for years when we go through this passage, why would it be a half a mile back? And of course, the very first thing, it's the presence of God, right? It's the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, we even have scriptural evidence that touching the Ark of the Covenant ends up very badly. We cannot just waltz in and make our way and do things that we want or try to force God to do things. So putting our hand even on the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, ended up very poorly, right, in the Scriptures. But a half a mile seems a little extensive for that to me. I think it would have been fine to say, hey, stay back, you know, a few feet even. But a half a mile. And so I present to you, and I can be wrong, it is okay, because when we get to heaven, my sisters and I always said this, uh, well, when we get to heaven, we'll know who's right, right? Uh, and at this point in my life, I will tell you, that's still true, when we get to heaven, we'll know who's right, but I really won't care, because we are in heaven, and that's really what matters, right? So you can come to me when we're in heaven and say, Pastor, you were wrong about that. It's okay. And this is not a theological point, otherwise this would be a bigger concern for me. But here's what I present to you as a possibility of the half a mile back. Is it not possible, especially as he's talking, God is, all through this story about how he's going to show the people that he's in charge. Show the people that Joshua is a leader. Is it possible that staying a half a mile back from the Ark of the Covenant might be more about having as many people as possible see what God is going to do? If you have ever stumbled across a scene of something going on, a lot of people gathered around, who can see what's happening? Really only the people right there, right? Unless you are blessed with something that I'm not, height. Maybe you can look down upon. I can't. If I'm not one of the first two or three people, all I can hear are the oohs and ahs of whatever's happening, right? So maybe God wants them to stay back so that they can see what is happening. Now, please hear me. I'm not minimizing the respect and honor and awe due to the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, it is the Ark of the Covenant that causes Eli to fall back on his chair, right? Remember that story, that when he hears that the Ark of the Covenant has been taken out into battle and the word comes back that his sons have been killed, he hears that, not, 
Not with great joy, I'm sure with tears and sorrow, but it's when he hears that the Ark of the Covenant has been lost in battle that he falls back on his chair and dies. And I tell you, it gives me chills right now even to tell you, imagine today if the word that I had to share was what Eli heard. God has left us. His presence is no longer with us. There's no wonder he fell back on his chair right? But I'm grateful that's not our experience. He is here today, and he says, stay close. And he says, watch what I am going to do. So we come back to the scriptures. Let's see, we are, verse 5, then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to his priests, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. So he started out ahead of the people. And Joshua, no, I'm sorry, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites ahead of you. Look, for the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, and as soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and, a ri and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left the camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water's edge, the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed on to the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed. As soon as all the people passed by, they waited there until the nation of Israel had crossed over on dry ground. So if you had to describe this scene of the priests carrying the Ark and God creating a way through, how would you describe that scene? With your hands, how would you describe that scene? Some people see the water going up on dry ground. And I will tell you, that is not what we just read. That did happen. That was the Red Sea. God stood the waters up and they passed through. But this story records for us that as soon as the priest's feet touched the water at the river's edge, the water upstream at a town called Adam, which theologians and archaeologists uh, argue between which one it is, but it's somewhere between 10 and 20 miles away. That's where the water stopped. So what happens here? When you put your feet in the water and the water up at Adam stops, What's different here? Let me help you. Nothing. All right, I don't know if you've ever had a garden hose that you turn off at the, uh, the faucet, and then you go back over, and depending on how long that hose is, you can spray that thing for a while and wonder, did I turn it off or on? And you're just spraying, but it's because all of that water's got to come out where you stopped it up a ways away. So what's here? looks exactly the same. So I was at this place out to eat with my family and uh, avoiding packing up because I knew I wasn't going to be doing it. And I can still remember the place in the parking lot that I was at this restaurant. We're heading in because at that moment as we're all getting out and it's finally all that's behind me, you know, for a moment and I'm just enjoying being with my family and my graduation, my high school graduation, Right then I see coming out of the restaurant, Mr. Curran, the treasurer from Mount Pisgah Academy. And I said, oh, no. Now, I'm sure no one in Lakewood avoids anybody, but that was my desire, 
right? And if you, and I know that you don't, but if you were that kind of a person, you would see them and immediately kind of put your head, you know, like, I don't see them, but I'm looking to see, did they see me? Do I need to adjust to try to get out of there or whatever? And sure enough, I averted my eyes, and Mr. Curran turned and started walking straight for me. I said, oh, no. So I sent my family ahead, and, uh, and I went to Mr. Curran, and he said, Joe, first of all, I want to congratulate you on your graduation. You did well. Secondly, and I'm like, here it comes. He's going to tell me i got to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning at the nursing home for work and whatever. And, and he said, you have, a, you have a substantial bill left with Mount Pisgah Academy. And I said, Mr. Curran, I know. And, and I was just about to tell him, I'll be there on time at the nursing home at 6 a.m. And he said, and I need to let you know that it's been taken care of. And I say, and I'm just going to pause to say, first, thanks to God, right? God is the one who blesses us, but he blesses us through people just like you. And so again, I say thank you for your commitment to Christian education. But So I went into the restaurant where my family was, and I'm like, hurry up and eat. Let's get back. We've got to pack up. And they're like, you're the one that wanted to come out to eat. And I said, now I don't. We've got to go. <laughs> like before they changed their mind over there. Uh, so anyway, we ate. Went back, packed up, and left. Went home, but I still knew. I felt like God was still calling me to ministry. But I had no money. And I tell my mom this. And my mom said, son, if God's calling you to ministry, which was, for me, Southern Adventist University, Southern College at the time, right? Because conferences aren't picking up pastors at a community college back then. They're looking for people who have theological knowledge and education in our schools. And so she said, look, if God's calling you to Southern, you need to go. And I said, Mom, I don't think you understand. And this is nothing against Southern. I went to Southern. I loved Southern. It was an enjoyable experience. And my kids are there now. I've got a son who's there. Um, but I told my mom, I said, Mom, they don't care what your name is until you have the entrance fee. Right? I mean, this is not going to be a picture of me walking up and then putting their hand out for the entrance fee and me putting my hand in there and saying, my name's Joe. And they say, well, where's your entrance fee? Oh, it's okay. My mommy said to come here. <laughs> right? That's not how this is going to work. And, but she kept on and she said, if God is calling you, be committed to God. Right? If God's calling you, then move. And so I started packing, and it was not with a full commitment of faith. I'm just going to be honest with you. But I started packing, thinking this is ridiculous. But it was in the mail that week that I got. It wasn't that day, but it was that week that I got in the mail a check from the insurance company, or sorry, from the hospital, because I paid for the surgeries. My, apparently there was some school insurance that paid. I guess my dad's insurance paid, and there was a refund to me. Entrance fee, I'm going to say, was about $1,500, and it was just over $1,500. And I said, and literally, I looked up to, I don't know why, but, you know, we'd look up, and I just said, God, all right, I'm all in. Amen. And so went, and God provided the jobs, and, and everything went well, but I just think, what if all that I could see was the obstacle in front of me? Because finances were an obstacle. I'm not going to lie. Money was an obstacle. And if that's all I could focus on, God had already resolved the problem that I saw, yeah. right? And I think about these Israelites as the priests step into the water, feet at the edge of the river. How sad would this story have been if it was recorded for us that, and the Israelites looked and nothing changed, so they went back to camp. When the problem's already been solved, solution's already there, we're just waiting for this to go by so that we can march through the ground that God has provided for us. What a sad testimony that would have been. I'm thankful that wasn't theirs, and I'm grateful it was not mine either. When I pastored, one of the first districts that I pastored in, I had a, a church member who was a, a dump truck driver. And I preached a message, and I am convinced to this day that the Holy Spirit connects with us through the spoken word in ways that we, the speaker, have no idea. And I'm okay with that. Whatever God wants to do and brings out in a message, I am excited if he is able to use the words 
uh, that come from my mouth. But I'm convinced of that because of things like this. And speaking that Sabbath, and it was not about the Sabbath, and it was not about the Ten Commandments, and it was not about not working on Sabbath. And all of those are great messages that I have preached and will preach and do preach and am supportive of. Please don't mishear me. But I know it was not that. And I say that because when I got to the back, uh, as people were walking out, they were talking with me. And this one guy came over, this dump truck driver, and he said, Pastor, because of the message you spoke today, I've decided I need to tell my boss I can no longer work on Sabbath. And I was excited about that, but at the same time, I'm reviewing everything that I said, and I'm like, I didn't say anything about that. So how the Holy Spirit works on our hearts is completely in, in his hands, and I'm thankful for it. But he said, would you be willing to go with me when I talk to my boss? Oh, mm, I don't know about that. This is a pretty big guy, and his boss I'm picturing even bigger. I'm like, ugh. Now, I did not pause like that. Of course, I said as a pastor, yes, absolutely. In my mind, I'm thinking, God, really? Uh, this is a David and Goliath kind of a moment that I'm picturing. But, but I'm in. This is what God wants me to do. And this church member needs this. I'm moving forward. So I start driving over on this particular day. And he calls me up on the cell phone. He says, Pastor, listen, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do it today. Um, I said, okay, okay. So I turned around, had prayer with him, turned around, came back home. And uh, it was several weeks later. He asked me again after church, Pastor, I really feel convicted to, uh, to go talk to my boss. Would you be willing to come talk to me or come talk with me? And I said, yeah, I'll be willing. So I went over again on the way over, calls me up on the cell phone. And so I had prayer with him, turned around and came back. And I would love to this morning stay before or stand before you and say, that before I left that church, he made the commitment, took the stand, God blessed him, but I can't. In fact, he kind of stopped coming to church, even on the Sabbaths that he didn't have to work because he felt so bad. And it was years later. I was at a large church, a gathering of a bunch of Adventist people, and, and I hear someone behind me yell, Pastor Joe. I have no idea who it is. I recognize the voice a little bit, but when I turned, this large man engulfed me in a hug. And so I, I hugged him. And I let go, and he didn't. I said, okay. So we just held there for a little while. Then finally, we let go where I could step back and see who it was. And it was this guy. It was the dump truck driver from, from that church. And he said, Pastor Joe, I've been wanting to talk to you for years. He said, it was after you left that I finally did something about what God was convicting my heart of. He said, I went in and talked to my boss, and I told my boss I'm going to have to quit because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I don't work on Saturday. And he said his boss leaned forward in his chair and said, when did you become a Seventh-day Adventist? And he said, I've been a Seventh-day Adventist all my life. And he said his boss slammed his fist down on his desk, angry. And he said, how could you not tell me till today? He said, you would have not worked on any Saturday. I just thought, the river, right? If all we see is the obstacle, when God has already taken care of the solution and we head back to camp, how embarrassing that we're sitting in camp praying to God, God, help us to get to the promised land and there's nothing but dry ground waiting if we would just get up and move when he says move. And he said, Pastor, I just can't believe that it took me that long to do what God was asking me to do. It's about our commitment to God, right? And here's one more point of hope that I give to you, real short, but a point of hope. It's not just the problems that we see that God takes care of because he knows about what's ahead, right? If I know anything from youth ministry, it is that kids are always hungry. Isn't that right? I mean, I drive a bus, the big uh, coach, have 55 kids behind me, and we'll pull off the interstate for food and get them all coming off. Thanks, Pastor Joe. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks, Pastor. You're welcome. You're welcome. They're going one by one. Then we get back on the bus. Oh, everybody's just eating. I can't even get to the interstate before a kid has come up to me and said, when are we stopping for supper? I said, we, we just ate. I know, I know. But seriously, when are we stopping for supper? So we are always hungry. And I think of Joshua here who's excitedly crossing the banks of the Jordan on dry ground. 
And likely, maybe not again, you can tell me when you get to heaven that I'm wrong. But as a youth pastor, I can tell you this is the likely thing that I'm waiting to hear someone say, when are we eating? I mean, this was great, and God is good, but seriously, when are we going to eat? And Joshua, what does he have? What have they been eating? Manna, which ends now, right? Now, we're going to have to leave the days of Kroger that we live in today or whatever grocery store, Myers, Walmart, whatever is your grocery store that you're shopping at. That's not the children of Israel. Joshua's answer for the children of Israel is, oh, you're hungry. Hold on. I got a tomato seed. I will put this in the ground, and we will be eating tomatoes in, anyone know, any farmers here? Earliest, what, 45 days? Is that helpful? No. I can't imagine some kid coming up to me and saying, I'm hungry, and my answer is 45 days. And they're like, oh, thank you, Pastor Joe. You're always looking out for us. No, that wouldn't be helpful. But the Bible records for us in this particular section that we just read, the river was at flood stage because it's always like that in the harvest time. God has them heading into the promised land at the harvest time. When the manna stops, they're entering into a land that they hadn't even thought about, supper, the problem of what are we going to do for food, God's already taking care of a problem they don't even think about yet, that the trees and the fields are loaded for harvest, ready to pick and eat so that they'll be sustained through the winter or whatever season of non-growing and be ready for the next year. God doesn't leave them on their own, but has already thought about those problems in advance. That's the God that we serve. We serve a God who's not only capable of the problem that we can see that we can't figure out, but he already knows the ones that are coming up. I just want to read a verse for you as we kind of come to a close here. It says, well, this is from uh, Patri- or, sorry, Prophets and Kings chapter 13 before this verse. It says, those Christians who realize even in a limited degree what redemption means to them and to their fellow men will comprehend in some measure the vast needs of humanity. Their hearts will be moved to compassion over the spiritual destitute living under the shadows of terrible doom. You serve a God who can take care of the problem and the problems to come. You've got some hope to share with those out there. And here, right, Mrs. White is sharing that those of us who have even a glimpse of that reality, our hearts will be moved for them because they have a need for some hope. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24 says, as I close, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they're still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. Thank you, Pastor Joe, for the message. And while we wait for the worship team to come back up for our closing song, I did want to take this opportunity to remind you that tonight we are taking the clocks back. It is daylight savings time. I was just informed, so in case anybody else needs a reminder, that is happening overnight tonight, so we are falling back. So let's stand as we sing our closing song, Oh, When Shall I See Jesus, hymn number 448. Oh, when shall I see Jesus and reign with him above and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morn and from the shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Oh, shall glory, for I shall mount above the skies when I hear the trumpet sound in that morning. 
Heard on the gospel armor of faith and hope and love, and you'll hear the trumpet sound in that morning. And when the combat ended, he'll carry you above, and you'll hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Oh, shall glory for us shall burn above the skies. When I hear the trumpet sound in that morning Our ears shall hear the transfer the host of heaven sing And shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning Our tongues shall chant the glories of our immortal King and shall hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Oh, shout glory, for I shall mount above the skies when I hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Oh, shout glory, for I shall mount above the skies when I hear the trumpet sound in that morning. Let's pray. God in heaven, what a privilege it has been to gather in this space with the family and just worship you. We thank you for hearing the prayers that have been lifted up before you, for hearing the songs of praise that have come from our hearts. And God, we thank you for bending your ear low to this place. God, I pray that as we have gathered together here, our hearts have been encouraged as we head out from here, that the hope that we have found, that you are still God and you do still love us would inspire us to share that hope with others. God, we thank you for the food that's been provided for us. Pray that it would nourish us and bring us strength, that all that we say and do would bring you honor and glory. And God, I pray that we would be committed to you to the degree when you say it's time to move, we will move. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We just have a couple announcements to share with you. Don't forget, as Pastor Joe said, we are having potluck. All are invited downstairs for our fellowship meal. We do have one-on-one -on -one prayer available with the elders. If anybody would like to request that, please seek out one of the elders. And on Fridays, or I'm sorry, every night at 7, except Fridays, we have prayer meeting on Zoom. In the following few weeks, we have a guest speaker who will be joining us next Sabbath, Cindy Huskins. On the 18th, Pastor Q is back with baptisms. And on the 25th, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving with a potluck. And the first Sabbath of December, we are um, going to be worshiping with Noah, with Noah students and um, their principal, Wanda Lugo. So she will be here speaking. The kids will be here uh, leading out in the worship that Sabbath. We are really excited. That is going to be the first Sabbath of December. I'll turn the time now over to Laura. Okay, just so everybody knows, today we're not having tables for potluck here in the community center. We're all gonna meet downstairs because we're gonna be praying together at one o'clock and two o'clock. So if you need help going down, uh, you can reach Salathio, Salathio Jr., maybe Mark or uh, Manny to help you go downstairs and carry whatever you need to carry. Okay? Thank you. And I hope that wasn't a big inconvenience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Mm -hmm. 